Hello and welcome to another teaching by 119 Ministries. Our ministry teaches that the whole Bible is true and applicable for our lives today. If you would like to know more about what we believe and teach, please visit us at testeverything.net. We hope that you enjoy studying and testing the following teaching. Search me, O Elohim, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way of the everlasting. This particular teaching is a follow-up to the testing the Star of David teaching, intended to address some frequently asked questions. We have known for years that once we released a teaching on this subject, it was going to be quite controversial. Much to our surprise, it had one of the highest agreement rates out of the 200 plus teachings we have released to date. Despite that, out of the nearly 30,000 that have watched the teaching a week after its release, there also exists a small but passionate minority defending the image of the Star of David. We also understand that an online petition consisting of 68 people at the time of this video was signed, passionately demanding we remove the testing of the Star of David teaching. While 68 out of 30,000 may not sound like enough to warrant a follow-up FAQ, collectively, they do in fact ask some good questions and make some interesting points. We respect that and admire their passion for what they believe to be right. Some time ago, we released a teaching titled, The Church, His Model, which was also highly controversial. It taught that the biblical model, when assembling together, did not include a singular head pastor to lead a congregation, but instead a plurality of elders. Understandably, there were many head pastors quite vocal against that teaching. We released a follow-up FAQ video which addressed some of the questions and concerns. It has been a blessing to know that some of those concerned congregations have either adopted or are in the process of adopting the biblical model for a faith-based organization. Likewise, we hope that this FAQ on the subject of the Star of David will respectfully offer some clarity to those who have expressed concern or still have questions. If you have not watched the Testing of the Star of David teaching, we would recommend watching that teaching before continuing with the FAQ. In that teaching, we conclude the following. Amos chapter 5 verse 26 and Acts chapter 7 verse 43 refer to a particular image of a star that Israel adopted in worship. That star is related to the god of Saturn, according to biblical scholars. According to the occult, it was known from ancient times that the hexagram, or six-pointed star, is considered to be the star of Saturn. Thus, based on biblical references of this star and confirmation of the star of Saturn being a hexagram, we issued prayerful consideration in adopting this star. At 119 Ministries, we desire to have a biblical basis for everything we do and teach. We have found no biblical evidence supporting the image of the hexagram in a positive way, but instead, only negative connotations. At this time, we would like to address some of the questions we have received in response to the Testing the Star of David teaching. The remainder of this teaching will be in question and answer format. Do we believe the hexagram is cultic or pagan in origin? No, we do not believe the hexagram is cultic or pagan in origin. We have never said any such thing. We do understand any confusion, as many simply make issues of something being pagan. Whether or not something is pagan or not is not the issue. The issue is that we should worship Yah in spirit and in truth, and not include anything in our worship of Yah that has been used to worship other gods and it is not expressly biblical in nature. Thus, it is not whether something is pagan, but instead whether it violates the Torah. For more on that subject, we would recommend the teaching, What is Pagan? The hexagram is present in nature in different capacities. Even the image of the related hexagon being found on Saturn would be an example of something Yahweh seemingly placed for His purposes, and perhaps that purpose may be more clear later in the video. While we do not believe the hexagram to be natively pagan in nature, we also do not believe bunnies, eggs, pine trees, mistletoe, the pentagram, or calves are natively pagan in origin either. Yahweh created all of those things. 
Yet you do not see 119 advocating for symbols embedded in Easter or Christmas or promoting golden calves in the worship of our Creator. The same holds true for the hexagram. We do believe that all the elements Yah wanted us to symbolically include in the worship of Him or be to use as biblical metaphors are already explicitly and clearly offered to us in the Scriptures, meaning this. It is either clearly of the Bible or it is of man. Acts 5.29 we must obey God rather than men. Our critics readily admit that the hexagram has been symbolically incorporated in worship of various false gods since ancient times, and that it even continues today. In that admittance, just like we do with the ways and traditions of Christmas and Easter, we point out the following in the Torah. Deuteronomy chapter 12, verses 29 through 32. When Yahweh your God cuts off before you the nations whom you go in to dispossess, and you dispossess them and dwell in their land. Take care you not be ensnared to follow them after they have been destroyed before you, and that you do not inquire about their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods? That I also may do the same. You shall not worship Yahweh your God in that way. For every abominable thing that Yahweh hates, they have done for their gods. For they even burn their sons and their daughters in the fire to their gods. Everything I command you, you shall be careful to do. You shall not add to it or take from it. Simply because something is used as a religious symbol that also occurs in nature does not sanitize it in any capacity. Yah is equated to an ox in the Tanakh. Calves also occur in nature. We would not tell Aaron that it was okay to create the symbol of the golden calf just because it occurs in nature, would we? Keep in mind, they did not literally worship the golden calf. Instead, they devoted their worship to Yahweh in the context of the symbolism of the golden calf. But surely, the hexagram cannot be compared to the golden calf, right? It is interesting to note that Stephen mentions the golden calf two verses before he mentions the star of Saturn. Is that a coincidence? Acts chapter 7. At that time, they made a calf and brought a sacrifice to the idol and were rejoicing in the works of their hands. But God turned away and delivered them up to serve the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets. It was not to me that you offered the victims and sacrifices forty years in the wilderness, was it, O house of Israel? You also took along the tabernacle of Molech and the star of the god Rampha, Saturn, the images which you made to worship. I also will remove you beyond Babylon. Consider these things. For the same reasons we do not use bunnies and eggs, or pine trees in the context of our worship of Yah, we also express caution incorporating a hexagram in the context of worshiping Yahweh. Sure, we can invent all kinds of potential symbolism of the hexagram and how it might have biblical metaphorical parallels. But man does the same with bunnies, eggs, Christmas trees, and many other things as well. In fact, Man did the same thing with the golden calf, and we all know how well that worked out. Woe unto thee, O Israel! You have sinned a great sin in the sight of God. Do we believe that the hexagram is evil? No, we do not believe the hexagram is evil in of itself. We have never said any such thing. We understand how that could have been confused. To clarify, we will again point to other symbols that have been incorporated in the faith. We do not believe bunnies, eggs, pine trees, mistletoe, the pentagram, or calves are evil in of themselves either. Yet for the same reasons we do not use those things in our worship of Yah, we have taken the position of not attaching the hexagram to anything related to the worship of our Creator. It does not matter if you have bunnies or pine trees in your backyard, or eggs in the fridge, or even a flower that resembles a hexagram growing in your garden. That is not the point. The point we are attempting to make is that we do not want to take those objects like the nations have in their worship of false gods and repackage them with man-made symbolism and inject them in the context of the worship of our Creator. 
If Yahweh was actually okay with us worshiping him in the ways that other gods have been worshipped or symbolized, then he would not have told us not to do such things in the Torah. Likewise, we do believe that the hexagram has been and continues to be used for evil in the worship of false gods. We believe the first instance in usage of this symbol in a religious setting, according to archaeological records, was for false god worship. Such evidence will be presented later in this FAQ teaching. Is 119 anti-Semitic? No, 119 is not anti-Semitic. We know that nearly everyone familiar with 119 understands this, but there are some that are genuinely concerned. We love Israel, and we claim to be grafted into Israel. We are not against the very group we claim to be part of. Yet, it has been suggested that we are anti-Semitic because we do not necessarily agree that a hexagram appropriately symbolically represents Israel or should be included on items used in the context of worshiping our Creator. Being cautious of or even against a particular usage of a symbol does not necessarily equate to being against a people. We simply claim the menorah as a valid and biblical symbol of Israel. Yes, there are those who are anti-Semitic that are also against the history of the Star of David, and they like to point that out. However, there are those who are against Christianity because they know the origins of the traditions of Christmas and Easter. Many atheists propose that Christianity is simply Mithraism repackaged. Just because 119 Ministries teaches against Christmas trees does not mean we dislike or hate Christians. Likewise, just because we express caution surrounding the hexagram does not mean we dislike Israel or Jews. To equate 119 to being anti-Semitic is not a fair representation of reality or logic any more than it could be said that 119 dislikes Christians. Simply put, we test and examine the traditions of both Jews and Christians and compare both to the scriptures. Just like we must discard worshiping Yahweh in association with a Christmas tree or Easter bunnies, likewise, we do the same with the hexagram. We can do no different as we find the comparison to be the same. We have found that there is no shortage of actual Jews that are against the Star of David. For some of the same reasons we have already outlined, if not for more reasons. Would that make such Jews anti-Semitic? What would that even look like? We bring these things to light because we love the Jews. If we did not love the Jews, we would not care to teach on this subject. Did not the Messiah correct the Pharisees in love and a sincere desire for change? Or was our Messiah anti-Semitic despite also him being a Jew himself? Do we believe the modern state of Israel to consist of real Jews? Generally speaking, we would agree that most in Israel are actual descendants of the house of Judah. We understand that there are strange doctrines that exist that teach that real Jews are one group of people or another. We do not subscribe to such teachings nor agree with them. Do we condemn the forming of the state of Israel? No, we do not condemn the forming of the state of Israel. We fully believe that the modern state of Israel exists today to fulfill Yah's purpose and divine timing. For example, we know that in the future there is an event called the Abomination of Desolation that will take place and armies will surround Jerusalem. Without the modern state of Israel, this would not occur. This may be difficult for some to receive, but consider the following questions. Has Jerusalem ever been invaded because Israel was obeying the Torah? Or does invasion and exile occur because of disobedience to the Torah? Israel was always invaded because of their disobedience. Israel will be invaded at some point in their future, coupled by what the prophets and our Messiah dubbed the abomination of desolation. While we love Jews as they are our brother Judah, Generally speaking, they need to come fully back to the Torah they claim to have faith in, just like our Christian brothers in the Messiah. In Jeremiah 3, we see that while the house of Israel did not return at all, the house of Judah never returned to Yah with her whole heart. What does that mean? As an example, in Mark chapter 7, we see the Messiah accusing the Pharisees of forsaking the word of God to follow the traditions of the elders. 
we see today that most Jews still do not follow the Torah as Yah intended and as our Messiah taught and exampled. Instead, we generally see most Jews practicing the traditions of the elders, thus nullifying the word of God as written by Moses. Generally speaking, this still occurs to this day. Those in Judah who understand this will flee according to Yeshua's direction following the abomination of desolation. We say this only to show that both Jews and Christians have adopted traditions that are contrary to the Torah. We all need to work together to bring the errors we have inherited to light so we can expose them and destroy them, leaving us with only the pure light of the Torah. Yah wants us all to come to Him with our whole heart, not with man-made images, doctrines, and symbols we may esteem so highly. Jeremiah 16 O Yahweh, my strength and my stronghold, my refuge in the day of trouble, to you shall the nations come from the ends of the earth and say, Our fathers have inherited nothing but lies, worthless things in which there is no profit. Could the star mentioned in Acts 7.43 and Amos 5.26 refer to a five-pointed star instead? We have found no ancient evidence that the star of Saturn is a five-pointed star. Evidence suggests that the star of Saturn is a six-pointed star. We discuss this later in the teaching. Could it be that Israel was simply worshiping an actual star and not a six-pointed image? It was the God of Saturn that was referenced in context to the star being associated with worship. Both Amos 5.26 and Acts 7.43 state that it was an image Israel created to be included in their worship. Thus, the star in question is an actual image of a star, not the star itself. Acts 7.43 you also took along the tabernacle of Molech and the star of the god Rampha, the images which you made to worship. I also will remove you beyond Babylon. The image of a star related to the god of Saturn was made or replicated by Israel and used in the context of worship. How confident can we be that the hexagram is the same as the star of Saturn? The star Stephen mentions in Acts 7.43 is referring to Amos chapter 5. Amos 5.26 You shall take up Sikuth your king and Kiyun your star god, your images that you have made for yourselves. Stephen mentions the god Raphan to be associated with the noted star. Stephen was quoting from the Septuagint, which is the Greek version of the Old Testament, the Tanakh. As we see in the Hebrew scriptures, Raphan is the god Kiyun. Kiyun is dominantly believed by scholars to be the god of Saturn. Strong's H3559, Kiyun, probably a statue of the Assyrian Babylonian god of the planet Saturn and used to symbolize Israelite apostasy. And in another lexicon, the name of an idol worshipped by the Israelites in the wilderness, i.e. the planet Saturn. Let's read again what Stephen said, Acts 7.43. You also took along the tabernacle of Molech and the star of the god Rampha, Saturn, the images which you made to worship. I also will remove you beyond Babylon. After mentioning the star of Saturn, Stephen also quotes Amos to state, I also will remove you beyond Babylon. Why does he say, also remove you beyond Babylon, after mentioning the star of Saturn? Yahweh states that the star of Saturn was taken along by Israel, meaning this, they certainly took it from somewhere. Was this star taken out of Babylon? This appears to be the case as revealed in the last half of the verse, almost as if Yahweh is saying, just as you took this star of Saturn beyond Babylon, you also I will take beyond Babylon. Acts 7.43, let's read it again. You also took along the tabernacle of Molech and the star of the god Rampha, Saturn, 
the images which you made to worship. I also will remove you beyond Babylon. Isn't that an interesting play on words? Because Israel took these things out of Babylon, and thus beyond Babylon, Israel was also exiled beyond Babylon. Is there anything to suggest that the star of Saturn was used to worship the goddess Saturn in ancient Babylon? At this point, it would be beneficial to examine some history concerning the hexagram. As we already know, the hexagram is heavily linked to the occult. In fact, the word hex, which means a curse, essentially comes from the word hexagram, the six-pointed star. If you put a hexagram on a person, the occult meaning is this. You are putting a curse on the person. When you put a hexagram on a nation, the occult significance is that the nation is under a hex or a curse. But from where did the occult develop this practice of utilizing a hexagram for such purposes? The hexagram in a religious setting dates back to the earliest archaeological records ever discovered. The Sumerians were likely the first anti-Yahweh culture that flourished after the flood. A teaching we would recommend related to this is a biblical profile of Nimrod. Sumer, like Babylon, consisted of ancient Mesopotamia. Babylon became the empire that Sumer started. They were the same people. The Sumerian artifacts that we are going to present are dated to be about 2,500 to about 3,000 years before Yeshua, or about 4,500 or 5,000 years old. Obviously, well before Israel as a people even existed. The first documented image of the hexagram is found in Sumerian Cylinder Scroll 243. This seal is currently at the Berlin Museum of Near Eastern Antiquities. Many of these finds were discovered by the German Oriental Society from 1899 to 1917. They were made public in 1930 in the Bode Museum. They have been in Germany ever since. It is interesting to note that the earliest archaeological and religious discoveries that include Sumerian, Babylonian hexagrams were German discoveries. This is the same symbol Hitler used to tag Jews in World War II, and these were important Sumerian and Babylonian findings during his lifetime by his nation. Some perpetuate Hitler's motives of tagging Jews with this Babylonian symbol by basically agreeing with Hitler's actions. You can clearly see the hexagram surrounding an astrological body, which is surrounded by additional astrological bodies. Cylinder Scroll VA243 the most knowledgeable scholars in the tangled field of Sumerian and Babylonian archaeology understand this collection of astrological bodies to be Saturn in the middle, surrounded by various constellations. Thus, the first anti-Yahweh civilization following the flood attributed the hexagram to Saturn. Ironically enough, as we revealed in our first video on this subject, Saturn itself retains a permanent hexagon shape on its north pole. Going back to the ancient Sumerian cylinder scrolls, we can see that Saturn is directly placed in the center of the hexagram, exactly where the hexagon inside the hexagram is located. On the actual planet of Saturn, we see a hexagon directly on the center of the North Pole. Scholars believe the god sitting in the chair is also the god of Ninurta. Ninurta is the name of the one of Mesopotamian gods associated with Saturn meaning Lord Earth or Lord Plow. The god Ninurta is associated with Saturn, and the celestial body in the hexagram is astronomically positioned as Saturn. Scholars also conclude that Ninurta is also the same figure known today as the biblical Nimrod. Interestingly enough, this would link Saturn and the hexagram back to Nimrod, according to secular scholars. In this, we realize that the hexagram is found in a Babylonian religious setting over 4,000 years ago, connected with the worship of Saturn. The symbol is more connected with the worship of the god of Saturn than anything natively Jewish, as Jews did not even exist yet. Acts 7.43 You also took along the tabernacle of Molech and the star of the god Rampha, Saturn, the images which you made to worship. I also will remove you beyond Babylon. 
Sumerian Seal 243 is not the only 4,000-year-old archaeological find presenting a six-pointed star in a religious setting. Here, note the six-pointed stars in the upper left and upper right corners. In both cases, note the presence of the accompanying dots in the groups of seven, again, Pleiades. The extra dot over the head of the smaller standing figure denotes a deity as it is a star. The seven dots are the seven stars of the Pleiades. If you recall, in artifact VA243, we also saw Pleiades surrounding Saturn which was denoted as a hexagram in that instance. In ancient Sumerian artifacts, Saturn was clearly linked to a hexagram in the worship of a particular god, the god of Saturn. As E. Douglas Van Buren, an expert in Sumerian and Mesopotamian art, comments, in the earliest representations of the seven dots as yet known, it can be seen that they formed a ring or rosette around a central dot, Saturn. From the early Babylonian periods onwards, it is increasingly common to find seven dots arranged like stars in the constellation of Pleiades. And in the last quarter of the second millennium, the dots are shaped for the first time as stars. In this ancient Sumerian seal, the six-pointed star of Saturn is again associated with the Pleiades representation. Again, we see a celestial body centered in this six-pointed star. While the star of Saturn originated in Sumer and greater Babylonian archaeological records, according to the scriptures, it eventually made its way into Israel at some point in history. Acts 7.42-43 But God turned away and gave them over to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets. Did you bring to me slain beasts and sacrifices during the forty years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You took up the tent of Molech, the star of your god Raphan, Saturn, the images that you made to worship, and I will send you in exile beyond Babylon. Jeremiah chapter 8 verse 2 And they shall spread them before the sun and the moon and all the host of heaven, whom they have loved and whom they have served, and after whom they have walked, and whom they have sought, and whom they have worshipped. And they shall not be gathered, nor be buried. They shall be for dung upon the face of the earth. We do find some archaeological evidence of Jews having adopted the usage of the Star of Saturn. For a rather thorough analysis of that history, we would recommend this article. We will highlight some of the evidence. Almost every researcher of the Star of David mentions this seal from Sidon. But although the seal was purchased in Sidon, it belonged, according to the inscription on it, to a fellow named Joshua, son of Asayahu, who lived in Israel during the latter kingdom, the 6th century BCE. The hexagram was also found in a synagogue in Capernaum. Cole and Watzinger noted in their books on ancient synagogues in Galilee that the origin of the Star of David is indeed pagan, and its meaning for pagans was magical. But its amazing appearance among the decorations of the synagogues in Israel shows that the Jews have adopted it as an emblem. Gershom Sholem, however, concluded from these findings an interesting observation. In it he says, In the synagogue of Capernaum, 2nd or 3rd century CE, it, the hexagram, is found side by side with the pentagram and the swastika on a frieze. Although scholars have attempted to trace the Star of David back to King David himself, no Jewish literature or artifacts document this claim. Rather, all evidence suggests that the early Jewish use of the hexagram was limited to practical Kabbalah, that is, Jewish magic, probably dating to 6th century CE. Kabbalah is linked to the usage of the hexagram. Note this particular amulet. On the front are many symbols, including two hexagrams on two pillars. These cultic seals can still be purchased today, although we obviously do not recommend it. The back side of the amulet contains a magic sun square and also some hexagrams. The occult is rather familiar with these magic squares. Adding the number of any column either horizontally or vertically and also two diagonal crossings of the square, the total is the same. 111. The sum of either the six columns or the six rows of the magic sun square is 666. Why did the sun square contain 36 numbers? Babylonian astrologers divided the starry heavens into 36 constellations. 
appropriating 10 days for each. These were represented by different amulets called Sigilla Solis, or the Sun Seal. Thus, the 36 numbers represented the whole host of heaven by representing all constellations in early Babylonian cosmology. Recall what the prophets stated about Israel and the whole host of heaven. Acts chapter 7, quoting Amos chapter 5. But God turned away and gave them over to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of prophets. Did you bring to me slain beasts and sacrifices during the forty years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You took up the tent of Molech and the star of your god Raphan, Saturn, the images you made to worship, and I will send you into exile beyond Babylon. Jeremiah chapter 8. And they shall spread them before the sun and the moon and all the host of heaven, whom they have loved and whom they have served, and after whom they have walked and whom they have sought, and whom they have worshipped, they shall not be gathered nor be buried, for they shall be dung upon the face of the earth. Kabbalah would also use these magic squares by placing Hebrew letters and signs over the numbers to gain supposed predictive insight. This magic sun square is on an iron plate and inscribed with Arabic numbers in a 6 by 6 grid. Such plates were buried in the corner of the foundation to ward off evil spirits. There are many squares, such as the square of Saturn or Jupiter. The occult credits these magic squares to Solomon. The seal of Solomon is described as a six-pointed and a five-pointed star. Often, the talisman of Saturn contains a hexagram on one side and a pentagram on the other side. Legend connects these symbols with the seal of Solomon, the magical signet ring used by King Solomon to control demons and spirits or protection from them. Recall the symbols found at the synagogue in Capernaum. In the synagogue of Capernaum, it, the hexagram, is found side by side with the pentagram and the swastika on a frieze. Whether the fact that the occult credits the sun square that mathematically equates to 666, to Solomon is of any significance is difficult to prove as an absolute. It should be noted, however, that Solomon is numerically associated with 666 and the Tanakh. 1 Kings 10.14 Now the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was 603 score and 6 talents of gold. We all know that Solomon went the wrong way for quite some time. The hexagram itself is also geometrically linked to three sets of sixes. The hexagram as a whole contains six points. The hexagram contains six triangles. The center of the hexagram is a six-sided hexagon. These magic squares have also found their way onto Catholic churches. For example, you can see one here. The hexagram has even made its way onto the infamous hat of the Pope. On the hat, notice the planet in the center of the hexagram, just like the Sumerian and Babylonian religion depicted Saturn. It is exactly the same. They also included Saturn in the center of the hexagram. While we cannot state for certain that this is where the Pope has derived this imagery, it is interesting to note that the Pope hat contains a hexagram with a dot in the middle, just as the Sumerians did. The Sumerians also placed seven dots around the image of the hexagram with Saturn inside of the hexagram. Also notice the seven red images surrounding the hexagram on the Pope's hat. We saw the same pattern and imagery in the Sumerian artifacts. And here with the seven stars of Pleiades occurring with other constellations surrounding Saturn and the hexagram. In summary, here are the facts. Ancient Sumerian artifacts contain the hexagram embedded over the center of Saturn and include the god of Saturn establishing the Babylonian linkage of the hexagram to the star of Saturn. The planet of Saturn actually contains the geometric center of a hexagram. The Brit Hadashah and the prophets know that Israel removed the star of Saturn from beyond Babylon and was used in the context of worship. Do hexagrams in nature symbolically associated with biblical concepts or metaphors prove that the Star of David should be associated with Israel or integrated in our worship of Yahweh? No. There are many teachings in the Bible, and nearly anything that exists can be used metaphorically and conceptually to teach any number of biblical ideas. 
We see this occur with traditions in Christmas and Easter, but it does not sanitize those traditions just because man can think of a biblical concept or a principle that could relate back to it. According to the Torah, if a symbol or a practice was associated in how the nations worship their gods, we should not include it in our worship of Yahweh. Deuteronomy chapter 12. When Yahweh your God cuts off before you the nations whom you are going in to dispossess, and you dispossess them and dwell in their land, take care that you be not ensnared to follow them after they have been destroyed before you, and that you did not inquire about their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods? that I also may do the same. You shall not worship Yahweh your God in that way. For every abominable thing that Yahweh hates, they have done for their gods. For they have even burnt their sons and their daughters in the fire to their gods. Everything that I command you, you shall be careful to do. You shall not add to it or take away from it. There are many things in nature that have hexagrams, such as snowflakes, flowers, and fruits. Does that mean I should keep them out of my backyard? No, that is not what the Torah teaches. According to the Torah, we simply do not incorporate religious practices or symbolism known to be associated with false god worship and in worship of Yahweh. The rainbow was hijacked by the LGBT community. Does that mean that I am to avoid the rainbow? No, that does not mean you are to avoid the rainbow. Unlike the hexagram, The rainbow is a true biblical symbol clearly given to us by Yahweh. In addition, and perhaps more importantly, while the LGBT community is certainly using the rainbow to represent a false ideology, they are not using the rainbow in the worship of false gods. If the menorah was used for cultic practices, would we have to stop using the menorah? No, of course not. Yahweh was interested in Israel not adopting the religious ways of the nations. If the menorah was suddenly used for false god worship, that would not make it the way of the nations. It would be biblical ways or biblical symbolism adopted by the nations. Of course, we have not found any false god religious practices that have adopted the biblical menorah into their worship of false gods just as we do not see any biblical holidays adopted by those that worship false gods. They, in fact, invent their own. We do not see any clear metaphors in Scripture detailing the hexagram as a biblical symbol. Archaeological records prove and demonstrate that the first religious usage of the hexagram was by the Sumerians and by the Babylonians, which we have already illustrated. If the Torah is about not worshiping Yah in similar ways the nations worship their gods, and the hexagram is just a symbol on a geopolitical flag, is that really an issue? There is some fantastic insight in this question. For example, the U.S. flag has pentagrams on it. Yet most do not associate the U.S. flag in their worship of Yahweh. It is a secular flag. Nations will do what nations will do. Thus, it is not violating Torah. However, the hexagram representing Yah's people could be argued to be different. Israel is not to be a secular nation, but be a light to the nations, representing our Creator in everything that Israel does. Choosing the star of Saturn as a symbol of Yah's people does not appear to be the best idea. The bigger issue is that the Star of Saturn appears on mezuzahs, menorahs, flags that are waved in worship, tallits, and other items associated with the worship of Yahweh. In that way, the Star of Saturn is being used in the same context of our worship of our Creator. Remember, the issue is not about worshiping the hexagram. No one claims to be worshiping bunnies, eggs, pine trees either. It is evident that no one is doing that. The Torah states that we are not to worship Yah in the same way and context that the nations worship their gods. It is just something to think about. It is not that the symbol in of itself is bad. It is just the fact that it has been historically used and is still used today in the worship of false gods. And that, Yahweh states he wants nothing to do with it in the context of worshiping Him. That should make some sense. History has proven that our tendency is to implement religious images, like the image of a hexagram or a golden calf in our worship of our Creator. 
This is the reason our Father instructs us to worship Him in spirit and in truth. We would encourage the body to pray about it, study it, and come to a decision themselves. I have seen teachings that associate biblical verses with natural occurrences of the hexagram in the attempt to justify its usage. What are your thoughts on that? The pomegranate, honeycomb, snowflake, lily, and almond flower have been presented in teachings to justify using a hexagram to represent Yahweh's nation of Israel and to be incorporated in worship of our Creator. As we have already said, there are many teachings in the Bible, and nearly anything that exists can be used to metaphorically and conceptually teach biblical ideas. We see this occur in traditions in Christmas and Easter, but it does not sanitize those traditions just because man can think of a biblical concept or a principle that could relate back to it. Elohim also has many five-sided elements in nature, yet we wouldn't condone a flag representing Yah's people or worship with a pentagram, either. Christianity goes at great lengths to attempt to associate Christmas and Easter traditions to the Bible, as a passionate attempt to retain their traditions for their own interests. Likewise, we see those attempts to justify the hexagram are by the same methods. The pomegranate. The pomegranate is a fruit, and its flower has hexagram characteristics associated with it. Pomegranates and bells were sewn into the hem of the garment of the high priest. The pomegranate is associated with many seeds, which we know to metaphorically relate to the Torah. The seeds are red. When a pomegranate is sliced in half, from the top down, it is not uncommon to find the seeds in four chambers. This suggests that the pomegranate could represent a heart, and the seed, or Torah, is in our heart. See Psalm chapter 40, verse 8, for an example of the obvious biblical metaphor. I delight to do your will, O my Elohim. Your law is within my heart. The blue, purple, and scarlet colors of the attached pomegranates likely symbolically represent our Messiah Yeshua. The blue would stand for the Torah, similar to the color of blue in our seat seats. The purple would stand for the royalty of our Messiah Yeshua, our King. This scarlet would represent the blood he shed for us and the forgiveness of our sins. The gold bells are something that we hear, invoking the act of listening. Listening is metaphorically related to obeying the Torah. The gold is also related to the Torah. We would recommend our teaching, Streets of Torah, for more analysis on the colors of blue and gold. Thus, the pomegranates and the bells speak to obeying the Torah. Unlike all of the other metaphors, we do not find any metaphors for us in the scriptures that define for us any hexagon characteristics of the pomegranate. All metaphors of the pomegranate are already present in the scriptures, with the exception of any hexagon characteristics. It is a stretch at best to project any value or metaphorical interpretation on the hexagon simply because of a pomegranate. In fact, when the pomegranates of the fabric are attached to the high priest, they would have likely resembled something like this. As you can see, the image of the hexagram is not retained. Honeycomb, Deuteronomy 27. And you shall write on them all the words of this law, when you cross over to enter the land that Yahweh your God has given you, a land flowing with milk and honey, as Yahweh the God of your fathers has promised you. There are multiple instances of honey being associated with the Torah. It has been suggested that because bees make honeycomb, and that because honeycomb are hexagonal in nature, that it biblically validates the usage of a hexagram. It is the honey itself that Yah metaphorically relates to the Torah. Yet the bees themselves are not necessarily metaphorically positive. Psalm 118. They surround me like bees. They were quenched like a fire of thorns. For the name of Yahweh, I will destroy them. So if the bees are not positive, yet they make the honey, what is there to suggest that the honeycomb itself is viewed by Yah as good? One can eat the hexagon honeycomb along with the honey. A little will not hurt you, and some do eat the honeycomb, arguing for some of its nutritional benefits. However, for many, it causes digestive distress when eating a small amount of honeycomb. In fact, if you eat too much of the honeycomb, it can kill you. 
Eating large amounts of honeycomb may cause gastrointestinal blockage, which is potentially life-threatening. The Cases Journal reports on a woman who landed in the hospital with a large stomach obstruction from eating large amounts of honeycomb over a two-month period. She thought large amounts would increase the health benefits. Instead, the honeycomb accumulated in her gastrointestinal tract and formed a large mass that required surgery to remove. The case reported was published in the May 2009 edition. So if you have a honeycomb, the best thing to do might be to chew on it to obtain the honey, Torah, but spit out the hexagonal honeycomb. It is interesting that the physical reality could teach that spiritual lesson, but perhaps it is just a coincidence. The Lily Luke 24, 27 Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Lilies typically have six petals. Therefore, it is argued that the hexagram, with its six points, is a valid biblical symbol. This, of course, is assuming that the image of the hexagram is the exact same thing as an image of the flower. Which, of course, it is not. The hexagram is referred to as a star, not a flower. The hexagram represents a star, not a flower. In modern Hebrew, this lily is referred to as the pure white lily. The word Shoshana is translated lily in several places in the scriptures, but the word itself could refer to other trumpet-shaped wildflowers of Israel, such as the fragrant blue hyacinth, also of the lily family. Moreover, there is no certainty that Shoshanim is the Hebrew word behind the Greek krina, lilies, of the gospel references. The lily's preference for secluded valleys has discredited it as a flower of the field. Several wildflowers native to Israel have been suggested in its place for lilies of the field in Matthew chapter 6 and Luke chapter 12. Scholars have proposed no less than half a dozen possible flowers that could be what is being referred to, and many do not have six petals. There are certainly some archaeological finds that illustrate a flower with six petals. However, there are also references to five petals, or even twelve in some instances. Even if the flower referenced did have six petals, it does not lend support for today's usage of the hexagram. In Hosea, we see Yahweh likened unto a pine tree. Does that mean that Christmas trees are now a good thing? We cover that in depth in the teaching Hosea's Christmas tree, which offers some nice parallels to consider as it relates to the hexagram debate. Snowflakes Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18 Come now, and let us reason together, says Yahweh. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Although they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. Because snowflakes naturally contain six points, and is found positively in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, it is then argued that hexagrams are biblically supported. This is the same argument already used for the pomegranate, lily, and honeycomb. Well, while sins being white as snow is a good thing, three times as often, snow is compared to leprosy. Exodus chapter 4. Yahweh furthermore said to him, Now put your hand into your bosom. So he put his hand into his bosom, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. Numbers chapter 12 verse 10. But when the cloud had withdrawn from over the tent, behold, Miriam was leprous, as white as snow. As Aaron turned to Miriam, behold, she was leprous. In 2 Kings chapter 5. Therefore the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and your descendants forever. So he went out from his presence a leper as white as snow. We would argue that leprosy is not a good thing. Almonds. Exodus 25. And on the lampstand itself there shall be four cups made like almond blossoms, with their calyxes and flowers. An almond flower can have five or six petals, and most of the time, it is five petals. Thus, the almond tree does not lend much support for a hexagram. Even if it did, it would be no better than the pomegranate, snowflake, or honeycomb. In conclusion, we hope that addressing these FAQs provided additional clarity on this challenging subject. We are not anti-Semitic. We are not saying that the hexagram characteristics of flowers, fruits, etc. are pagan in nature. In summary, there is little debate that the hexagram was used in conjunction with the worship of false gods. And because of that, according to the Torah, 
We should not want to attach such a symbol representing Yahweh's people and be associated in the worship of him. We have zero evidence that the hexagram was used by David to justify calling it the star or shield of David. However, we have a pile of evidence dating back nearly 5,000 years defining it as the star of Saturn. Perhaps it is time that we stop calling it the star of David and what it really is, the star of Saturn. While some are passionately interested in preserving such an image, the question becomes, why? The last thing we as his people should desire is putting the offense of man over offending Yah. Lastly, we would simply encourage others to research these things for yourself, all in an effort to test everything. Study these things, pray about them, and decide for yourself. Joshua 24, Choose this day whom you will serve, but as for me and my house, we will serve Yahweh. We hope that this teaching has blessed you. And remember, continue to test everything. Shalom. It is because of you, our generous supporters, who make it possible to offer these high-quality teachings completely free of charge. If you feel led to support 119 Ministries so that we can continue this effort, please visit testeverything.net and click on the Support 119 tab. Learn how you can partner with us to take the whole Word of God to the nations.